I'd like to invite you to come on a journey with me. It's a journey that's going to start in central Tanzania with Rosemary and Carolina and their beautiful chickens. I really love this photo. It provides an insight into that very special bond between people and poultry. We're told that we first domesticated chickens over 8,000 years ago. And across the world, as we see all the different breeds, all different shapes and sizes of chickens, it reminds us of this special fascination that we have in these birds. Some of you will have had an egg for breakfast this morning. That egg probably was produced by a commercial hen who was selected to lay eggs. Some of you might have had chicken for dinner last night, probably produced by a commercial breed that was selected for meat production. These birds do it all. They lay the egg, they hatch the egg, they take care of the chicks, and then they do it again. They do it in such a way that they don't compete with people for food. They eat food that we would not consider uh, as something that we would eat, and they turn it into a highly nutritious, valuable product for us. Chickens are the most commonly owned livestock across the world, and these particular village chickens, indigenous birds, are often the only livestock that the most vulnerable households will raise. In many parts of the world, they may be the only livestock over which women have some say, some control over. What I'm now going to do is ask you to become or to imagine that you are Carolina. So as Carolina, you are the head of your household. Your husband works in town, so taking care of the fields, planting, harvesting is your responsibility. And you also have five chickens. I want you to imagine now that you wake up one morning, you walk out, and two of your five chickens are dead. The other three are not looking very healthy. So for, as Carolina, you're sad, you're disappointed, but you're not shocked. And you're not shocked because across the world, in countries, um, all too often, chickens die once or twice a year from disease. In many cases, this is called by a disease that in English we call Newcastle disease. In Tanzania, it's called Mdondo. And this is a major constraint because that bird, the bird that passed away, would have been used to send children to school to provide food for a respected guest, to pay for medicine. Really a crucial, a crucial, crucial asset for you to have access to. But you've walked out this morning and it's not there. Now this disease, Newcastle disease, belongs to the same family of viruses as measles. And just like measles, there are vaccines available to prevent the disease. In fact, in many countries, you could not have a commercial poultry industry if you didn't vaccinate your birds. So you might be wondering, if we're able to vaccinate our commercial birds, why are we not vaccinating village chickens? Well, the problem is that these conventional vaccines have to be kept cool. You need to keep them between 2 and 8 degrees Celsius. So what we know is that in many villages, we don't have access to refrigeration. So I've had the good fortune to work with two very special people, Professor Peter Spradbro, Dr John Copland, with the support of uh, funding from the Australian government. They developed and have made available a thermotolerant Newcastle disease vaccine. Thermotolerant. It means it doesn't have to be kept constantly cool. It can retain its activity in the wet form for two weeks at temperatures up to 30 degrees. So all of a sudden, we have the ability to be able to get a vaccine out and get it out to the villages. So this is where I come into the story. I've been privileged to work with colleagues in Mozambique, Malawi, Tanzania, Zambia, working with a system that would ensure that not only did the vaccine get out there once, but it, that, that it continues to be available to farmers. And that's made possible by people like Mary. Mary's uh, from Malawi. She was selected by her community to be a community vaccinator. She's been trained. 
and every four months she now vaccinates chickens. For this work to be ongoing, she charges a small fee, something around two cents, five U.S. cents, that covers the cost of buying the vaccine. It compensates for her time, and allows the work to continue. You're probably also remembering that I said that often chickens are the only livestock the poor households have access to. So you might be a bit concerned that we're asking them to pay. It would be very nice if we could do it for free, but we all know that governments are under pressure. We don't have all the funds we need to do everything that's required. So if we want this work to continue, there has to be cost sharing. Asking a farmer to pay for this vaccine respects them and. Indicates that you understand that they will make good decisions. I was born and raised on a farm. I now have my own farm. I do have some insight into the challenges that farmers face, and I know that even if farmers may be considered poor, they're rarely stupid. So they know that for an investment of two U.S. cents down the track, they'll be able to get a return of two dollars, five dollars, because village chickens are very well received in the local markets. So, from Mary, with being able to increase flock size, what you see is that there are many options. Initially, she worked hard to have farmers participate in that first campaign. Farmers are a little bit conservative sometimes; they're not really sure that your vaccine's going to work. So, not all farmers will participate in that first campaign. But you can be sure when the disease comes into the village, absolutely everyone is watching, and they're watching to see whether those birds that have been vaccinated survive. With that, what you'll find over time is that more and more farmers will become involved. The numbers of birds being vaccinated increase. Therefore, the return for vaccinators also improves. It improves to the point where vaccinators like Asha, who is now quite a star in her village, She regularly now vaccinates 1,500 birds every campaign. With that money that she、uh, receives for that vaccination, she's able to continue to buy her vaccine. She's compensated for her time, but she is also a chicken farmer. And the last time I met her, she said that she'd traded her surplus village chickens or roosters in particular and bought four goats. So this very simple thing of vaccinating chickens has allowed her to diversify. Her assets and to spread her risks. It's a really amazing story. In many places in the world, women don't normally consider goats something that they would own. But in this case, because it's something that she has worked for within her household, that goat is considered hers. It's a quite a transformation. So she's. Emphasised, Asha has emphasised increasing chicken numbers. Farmers also have another choice: egg production. So in this case, Zuhara has decided that instead of hatching all of her eggs, she's going to collect some and work with her neighbours to sell them into the local markets, and also to be able to eat them within her own household. This is also quite a transformation. In many cases, when you go into a village where there is no vaccination, people don't eat eggs. Every egg that is hatched or that is laid has to be hatched, so that you're going to get replacement birds to be able to replace the birds that are dying from disease. So to have that option of now considering eating an egg is quite a transformation, and it's that transformation that, for me. Was the reason that I really have focused on the control of Newcastle disease for many years. It was really all about working to make sure that children were having access to a balanced diet. So this is Christina in Malawi, waiting to take good care of her chicken. It's going to be vaccinated. She's very proud. In many places, it's common for grandparents to give children、um, chickens as a gift for them to try their luck. Are they going to be good farmers? So in this case, Christina is taking good care of her chicken, and this chicken, in turn, this hen, is going to take good care of her. And I say that because if you think about an egg, everything that is in this egg is all you need for a chick: the bones, the muscle, the organs. It's all there in this one egg. 
It's something that you can store relatively easily in villages. It's usually sterile. And from the mother's point of view, it's great because it's very quick to cook. You don't need to have a lot of, spend a lot of time collecting fuel to be able to cook it. And very importantly, it's nutrient-dense. So in this small product, you have something that will fit very nicely in the small stomach of a child, and it can transform their diet. We know that in too many places, children are still undernourished. They're simply not getting the balanced diet that they need. We know that if children under the age of two do not get a balanced diet, that they never reach their intellectual potential, they're not as physically strong as they should be, and during their life they will be less productive than children that were well-nourished in those young ages. So it really is a crucial thing, and if we can take a small amount of chicken, or chicken liver, or an egg, and add that to a diet that's largely based on, on cereals, even in very small quantities, it has quite a remarkable transformation. So what is a very simple intervention? One chicken, one drop, every four months. You've had an amazing transformation. You've had a transformation in the lives of households. You've also had a transformation in the lives of communities and of governments, ministries of health, ministries of agriculture, are now happy to work together. Health has a real burden when you have undernourished children. Agriculture can help. So in this short journey together this morning, I've shared with you part of my journey of 20 years. Sometimes it takes a while to figure things out, certainly takes a while to build confidence and trust with farmers. But what I've come to understand that in the end, it doesn't matter which came first, the chicken or the egg. What you need is both the chicken and the egg if you're going to have a sustained impact on maternal and child health. Thank you. <laughs>